Welcome to the Discover Jesus podcast. This is a series of episodes developed in response to questions that students we meet on campus have about Jesus. My name's Lauren and I am a student intern in Belfast, which is the epicentre of the universe. And this is my colleague and acquaintance, Sean. I'm Sean and I'm a student worker. Uh, I'm based in Essex. Uh, Lauren and I both work for Agape Students. Um, we're an international Christian charity and we work with students to help them discover Jesus uh, together. Lauren and I don't have all the answers. That's part of the reason why we're here today. They sent us because mm -hmm. they, they thought uh, we were missing a few things. Uh, so we're, we're on a journey discovering Jesus ourselves and we love to help and encourage others to discover Jesus uh, for themselves too. So today we find ourselves not on campus but in the quaint little wee city of Oxford um, and we're at OCA, the Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics because yeah, Oxford has a dictionary named after it, so the people here must be reasonably smart. Um, yeah, so if you guys want to introduce yourselves, we have two special guests today. Um, why are you here? Who are you? <laughs> okay, so I'm originally from London, so let me just put that out there, okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, o Oxford has borrowed me. Um, <laughs> so yeah, my name is Claire, Claire Williams, and um, so I work at Oxford Centre for Christian Apologetics. Um, I grew up in a Christian home, had lots of questions about my faith, particularly when I got into my 20s and was like, oh, my, do I only believe this because my parents are Christian, that sort of thing. And so it led to lots of questions for me. And then studying apologetics, so studying reasons why Christianity may well be credible, um, really has helped to strengthen my faith. So um, what we're doing today is really, um, really kind of um, close to heart for me. Yeah, um, so I'm Max baker -Heitch. Um I'm a speaker with Ocker, but my other hat that I wear is that <clears throat> I'm a lecturer in philosophy at Wycliffe Hall at Oxford University. Um, before that, I did a PhD in philosophy at Oxford, and then before that, I did a BA and Masters in philosophy and theology at Exeter University, um, <clears throat> which is actually where I became a Christian at the age of 19. Um, which um, partly involved looking into the, the evidence for Christianity, was confronted by the intellectual case for Christianity for the first time in, in a way that, that really um, I, I hadn't anticipated, actually. And, and thereafter really became extremely fascinated with um, the sort of uh, looking into the, the philosophical arguments to do with God's existence, um, questions to do with the nature of evidence, the nature of rationality, um, and yeah, and extremely interested in the historical evidence around the person of Jesus. Brilliant. Well, we're really excited to have you with us today. I've got my notebook and pen ready in front of me to, to make copious amount of notes. Um, so today we're going to be looking at the topic of who was Jesus? So just to get us started <clears throat> and to help us to get to know you guys a little bit better, uh, we just have a quick question for you. So if, if you personally were to have your own cult following, <laughs> what is one thing that your followers would copy that, that you do? What would be your thing? <clears throat> My throat clearing mannerism. <laughs> <laughs> that is Claire classic Max. That's classic it. Max. Yes, yes. So mine would be have to be you have to cook with spice. Yeah, we don't know bland food out here. So Scotch bonnet, not Scotch bonnet from the supermarket, has no power. Scotch bonnet from Auntie Shop on the high street, okay. cooking with spice. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Scotch bonnet. Should I know what that is? You should know what that is. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a. It's, it's also called. I think it's called habanero. It's like a small chili pepper. It's like the shape of a lantern. And it's um, very, very hot. Okay, like one of the so hottest that's ones. Why I have never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> Can't hack. <hurt. laughs> if it's not a potato, you're not interested. Yeah. So that's the initiation, you know. If you can, if you can take the fire of a Scotch bonnet, you're in the Claire cult. Okay. Oh, that's yeah. such yeah, a good <laughs> So let's start with a pretty broad question: mm. Who was Jesus? Discuss. Well. I think I'd want to start by saying Jesus was a Middle Eastern Jewish man. And the reason I think I want to start there is because Western culture has domesticated Jesus. 
So many images of Jesus in churches, stained glass windows, paintings have made him look like a tall, blonde haired, pale skinned northern European man, which he wasn't. Um, and actually the, the, the differentness of, of Jesus' actual cultural background from the sort of Western culture um, that we're saturated in, I think is really important to appreciate. Um, Jesus, um, yes, according to Christianity, Jesus is God in the flesh so that he sort of has come to meet humanity where we're at. But that doesn't mean that we can just sort of mould Jesus to fit our cultural box. Mm, I think that's that's such an important point, Max, and I could talk about this for days because mm -hmm. I do think um, cultures do... Um, kind of represent Jesus uh, according to to their to what the, to who and what they look like and that that's fine but what's happened with this image of white Jesus is um so I went to I went to West Africa for like a, a church kind of um event and 2019 this was and on the walls of this church and we went to loads of churches in this country white Jesus was there the story and it's so something's happened something's gone wrong slightly where that's concerned where the um predominant view of jesus is this western image when actually there's nothing wrong with portraying jesus uh, differently in christian art nothing wrong with that but what is that saying about kind of like what's been done to the, the domestication of jesus or um you know eurocentric images of him so i really agree that we need to emphasize that jesus was a semitic man um from the first from the first century so what can we know or what do we know about Jesus as a historical figure? So um, E.P. Sanders, who was professor of New Testament studies at Oxford University, very eminent figure in the field of historical Jesus studies, he, he says that you know, there are no substantial doubts about where and when Jesus lived and the sorts of things he did during his public activity. And then he goes on to give a list of things that you know, there's a strong consensus among professional ancient historians that Jesus really did sort of milestones or key events in his life. And they include um, so that he was born around the time of Herod the Great, the, the great um, Jewish king who built a lot of sort of um, big landmarks that you can still go and see. So um, but uh, that he grew up in the town of Nazareth, which is in Galilee. Again, you can go there. Um, and that he, um, you know, he started his public activity actually off the back of another figure, um, someone called John the Baptist, who was, uh, who, who sort of um, was a revival preacher in the wilderness, who was inviting people to come and sort of repent and be ready for something new that he was claiming God was going to do. And he, and John the Baptist sort of saw himself as the forerunner to the Messiah. And so uh, Jesus' ministry then kind of comes off the back of that. And, and it becomes clear that then Jesus is claiming that he is the one that John the Baptist was preparing the way for. And, and that he calls, to, he calls a number of disciples to follow him. And disciple could be translated as student, actually. Disciple is not really a word we use in the modern world very much, but student. Mm -hmm. Um, and in particular, he has this kind of core group of 12, um, 12 disciples and that he goes around the towns and villages of, of Galilee uh, preaching this message that what he calls the kingdom of God is arriving. And, and the kingdom of God seems to be this idea that that um, God um, is bringing about a new kind of era in which um you know, uh, in some way, the, the people who, who want to be part of this are going to live in a radically different way. It's going to be a sort of a, a culture and a, a value system that inverts the values of the world. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Ones in, if, for example, in, in which uh, the least in society are going to be first. They're going to be the most esteemed. So there's lots more we could say about that, but um, so G the kingdom of God is very central to Jesus' teaching, and and scholars will agree that that this was this was his core message, and he conveyed it um, by way of parables, um, among other things. But also, and 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 this is you might be surprised to know there there is a solid consensus on this by scholars, including non Christians, that that at, at the very least people thought they experienced healings from Jesus. What, whatever explains that, whether it's the placebo effect, whatever, historians don't really 
kind of get into the mechanics of it. But what they will say is that it's very clear that there was a very widespread belief that people had experiences of pretty uh, um, remarkable healings um, from Jesus. And so he sort of, it, it, these healings seem to be the enactment of the arrival of this completely new way of mm -hmm. being, the, the kingdom of God arriving. The most kind of established of all facts about Jesus is that in about the year AD 30, he goes up for the Jewish Passover festival in Jerusalem, the, the kind of most important festival in the Jewish calendar. And um, he ends up being arrested by the religious authorities in Jerusalem <clears throat> who take him to the Roman authorities and ultimately get him uh, condemned to death and he's mm -hmm. crucified on a cross. Um, but then the story doesn't end there because shortly afterwards, Jesus' followers um, very sincerely believe, and again, this is something historians would agree on, even those who are not Christians, that at least the sincerity is very much there. Jesus' followers sincerely believe that he appeared to them again, alive after his crucifixion. And from Jerusalem, they go out with this message that Jesus is the, the resurrected Lord of the world, um, and, you know, the, and really <clears throat> what we kind of know now as Christianity is, uh, is sort of born. So do we know what Jesus actually said uh, about himself or what would he want us to know about him to, today in, in the 21st century? Mm. So I think that's a really interesting question because I think culturally where we are at this point in time, believing the testimony of what people say about themselves, who they are, is, is really where we are as a culture. I mean, really mm -hmm. dignify the things that people say about themselves. Mm -hmm. So let's take that same energy to what Jesus is said to have said about himself. But he made some extraordinary claims. And I think claims that we need to deal with if, we, if, we, if we're gonna be taking seriously what people say about themselves and listening to the claims they make about themselves, we need to do the same for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes when we domesticate Jesus, sometimes when we, don't want to have to deal with some of the things he had to say, we kind of just push it to one side. So some of the things Jesus says, one of the things I find, I mean, St. John chapter 4, 14, sorry, it's John 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through me. And that's like, hold up a second. Yeah, <laughs> You are making a huge claim, and we need to deal with that. So another time Jesus is talking to a woman at, at a well, uh, a woman who's from a different ethnic background to him, different religious background to him. He's talking to her and he says, he has the audacity to say, go and call your husband. And, <laughs> and actually that conversation, which is actually a really beautiful interaction, one of my favourite scriptures, challenges her in such a way that she ends up being a follower of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we have to deal with the stuff he said, you know, um, just, just, just just engaging with people, like challenging the religious elite, like someone goes to him and says, you know, how can I, um, the equivalent of today's question, how can I live my best life? Like, how can I be my best self? He said, they said, what is the greatest commandment of all? What's the best way to live? And Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and love your neighbour as yourself. And there's a point where the passage describes Jesus saying, he looked at this guy with compassion and said, like, you're not too far from the kingdom. You're not too far from knowing God's way to live. And so just these, these, these accounts of the way that Jesus interacted with people, we have to make a decision about them. We, and, and I think um, I would encourage anyone listening to, you know, read um, the Gospel of St. Mark. It's one of the shortest 16 chapters. You can read it, I don't know, in, in one sitting. And just look at the way Jesus behaved. And as uh, we were saying at the start, he wasn't soft. So he'd want us to know that he's a person who loves people deeply, interacted with, you know, the outcasts of his day, the poor women, okay, the racial others of his day. Jesus interacted with them. He broke those barriers down. So he's a person who loves people very deeply, but he also challenges them. And I think... Um, those are the sorts of things that Jesus would want us to know about him today. And with that challenge comes the question, will you follow me? Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned earlier, Claire, about uh, the passage in John, John 14, where Jesus says, I, I am the way. And I, I'm just wondering if that's, I don't know, to put it bluntly, is that not a bit arrogant? Can, can, can someone just claim to be the, the only way? Mm. Yeah, it's, 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 it's so arrogant. <laughs> 
<laughs> and we, it should make us bristle a little bit. And so my, my, my advice and my, my own experience with this kind of claim is to investigate it, to stress test the claim. So um, one of the things that Max was describing was how um, people had real believed, at least that they had real experiences of healing. So the, the idea that Jesus wasn't just a teacher, wasn't just an itinerant preacher, he was a person who could heal. I re referred to St. John chapter four, the woman, uh, a woman at a well who Jesus knew about her kind of relationship choices. She, ha how? Where was this supernatural insight coming from? Or um, the, the, the biggest claim of all about Jesus is that he rose from the dead. Mm -hmm. So stress testing those claims is part of what we should do, a part of how any of us, no matter what worldview we have, can your worldview stand up under the weight of your questions, life's deepest questions. And so that's what we need to do. So when I look at the life of Jesus, and when I look at the things he said about himself, the way he treated people, um, the fact that, you know, kind of like in our postmodern 21st century, uh, distaste for the supernatural, mm -hmm. actually you don't have to, you know, commit intellectual suicides, believe that miracles are at least possible. Mm -hmm. When you take the whole sort of cumulative picture of who Jesus is, I find him really compelling. Um, and so, yeah, if you're gonna make a big claim like that, it's gotta be substantiated. When I start to do that, that deep digging, it bothers me how compelling he is. Mm. Why does that matter? Why does it matter if Jesus did actually rise from the dead? Mm. So I, I, I think it's a really interesting question. I think you can answer it in, in, in a couple of ways, but I think that if you just take sort of popular like film and movie culture, you're, I'm, I'm a Marvel fan, I have to say. <laughs> any DC fans at this table, we, we won't be talking. But yeah, in a lot of these Marvel films, or just any kind of movie, when you've got this, uh, this villain parading around the universe trying to destroy or whatever, what they want, what people want in these films is eternal life. They want to live forever, right? That's what they want. This is, um, um, we, we, might, we might chuckle at that, but actually what we, what we see in films is a projection of what we're after. We have this desire that death should not be the final thief. We should conquer death. Like, it's just everywhere, you know? And I, I lost my father in 2018. And even though, you know, he wasn't suffering anymore and I, I believe in the Christian hope of, of the resurrection, the, that wouldn't shake the feeling of him being robbed from me, him being taken from me. The idea that when someone passes, that it feels wrong, that is an intuit that, that's an intuitive sense that is telling us something more. Perhaps this isn't the way it's meant to be. Why the resurrection matters for me is to show that death is not the final enemy and has been conquered. This thing that we know from our culture, from our own desires, from the way that we interact with family, the way we grieve, this idea that something is wrong with the whole idea of death, God has defeated that in the person of Jesus and promises a day when, you know, if we decide to follow Jesus, we too will share in that resurrection. Mm -hmm. So this this is not this is not this is not the final chapter, and I think that's a really um, powerful thing for me. This 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 longing for hope is answered in the person of Jesus, and so death doesn't win. And 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 also a very shameful, horrific, gruesome, tragic death. Like right? Jesus was dead, dead, dead because of the Roman executioners just being so expert in what they do, and that has been overturned. And that is a hope that I can't even put a name on. Particularly, also, I think when you walk through certain um, bereavements and you realise like the impact of death when it comes into your house mm -hmm. and takes your dad out or takes your whoever it is, you, you realise the power of death. Mm -hmm. And actually, the Christian claim is that the resurrection has broken that, but also the resurrection is the ultimate mark from God to say, "This is Jesus, and he is he is the Christ, he is the Lord." That's that was like the ultimate kind of receipt to say, here you go. <laughs> this is this is mind blowing, like, but what what are the implications for for me personally of of the resurrection? In the person of Jesus, God entered human history, he showed up. That that's the claim. And when we compare it to other worldviews, that's 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 really lacking. And so within Jesus' life, his teaching, his death and resurrection is this invitation to be with God, to restore that ultimate relationship that we we, we ultimately desire. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's everywhere. We see it everywhere in our culture, this desire for relationship. How can we be the, so, so, you know, the most connected generation ever 
all the apps and still feel so disconnected. How? What is that telling us that we, we long for relationship and in the person of Jesus, through, through everything we've just described um, in, in our discussion, is an invitation to, to be reunited with the God who has made us in his, in his image. I, I think it's, I think it's a beautiful thing. And when you start to do some of the real work of, of, of questioning this stuff and comparing and investigating what other worlds you say, religious or otherwise, there is a uniqueness and there is a beauty about um, what Jesus is offering us. So can we be sure that the Bible actually, that Jesus actually said he was God? Uh, are we, do we need to be careful that's not just something that, yeah. that people afterwards have, have looked back and, and said about Jesus? Does, what does he actually say in, in the Bible, for example? Right, so, so here's something that, where we do need a bit more nuance than is often had in these discussions. So, yes, I think Jesus did claim to be God, but I don't think he went around saying, I am God, in so many words. And this is important. If he did that, then he, it wouldn't have made any sense to his Jewish audience. I mean, either he would have been immediately stoned, or, or it would have sounded like he was claiming to be sort of a, a, another deity in, in the kind of polytheistic pantheon of gods, because lots of Roman emperors claimed to be, to be a, a deity, a god. So I think that the way that Jesus makes his claim to divinity makes complete sense within the, the, the matrix of meaning that existed in first century Judaism. So he implies this claim rather than says it very explicitly through his actions and some of the things he says. So how does he imply it? So I think he one of the ways he implies it is by doing actions and, um, and saying things that only make sense if he thinks he has the kind of authority that only God has. Mm -hmm. So claiming to forgive sins, um, he claims that the kingdom of God is coming through his very person. So somehow he is the vehicle through which this whole new way of being that God is introducing into reality is coming through the person of Jesus. The, the way in which he teaches and, and, you know, seemingly seems to kind of revise the law that was given to Moses in the Old Testament. He says things like, you've heard it said, you know, an eye for an eye. But I say, <clears throat> you know, forgive and love your enemies. Um, and so he, he seems to be claiming a, a, a very, um, you know, exalted kind of authority for himself. Um, and it's no wonder that he started to kind of provoke suspicions, um, which ultimately ended up in him getting crucified. And actually, this is a point that's that's been made against the, the sort of very... Um, revisionist historical scholarship on Jesus that basically wants to say he was a he was a nice sort of liberal moral teacher, and and the the challenge that is always put to that perspective, and I think it is right to be put put to that perspective is so how did he end up getting crucified by the Romans if he was this lovely, you know, inoffensive moral <laughs> teacher, this sage dispensing wisdom, and I, th I think. It doesn't make sense. He he ended up on a cross because he he was extremely provocative, and he was extremely provocative because he was claiming for himself the kind of authority that actually would only make sense if he thought he was God incarnate. So, if um, anyone that's listening wants to find out more or think more about what we've talked about today, do you have anything that you would point us to? Where would we go to do that? Yeah, I think um, I would encourage everyone who's listening to really uh, interrogate some of the things that Max was saying. Sorry, Max, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> about the the claims of the resurrection because that's the huge that's that's, that's 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 the elephant in the room. I think for a lot of people. Mm. So if you just go onto YouTube and you type in "Did Jesus rise from the dead," um, that you should see a two part video series, basically looking at that question and looking at some of the other um, explanations of the empty tomb essentially so um and just if you don't find it just did jesus rise from the dead you can type in dr craig because there's a philosopher called um, william lane craig and his kind of organization made those videos so check those two videos out i think you'd find it quite interesting watch and what's the name of the organization the organization is called reasonable faith lovely mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's a great resource. And, and a book um, that I think uh, is also very helpful on this question of the evidence for the resurrection is called The, the Case for the Resurrection of Jesus, I think. Um, and it's by two scholars, um, Gary Habermas and Michael Lacona. It's a short, um, very accessible book, um, which I think is, is very helpful. Can I sneakily add one more thing? Yes, of course. <laughs> always pushing it. I, I know, I ask it a lot here. I would just say, particularly if you have never read one of the accounts of Jesus' life, yeah. I would suggest you, you do that. Even if, even if you know, you're not convinced about who we say he was in, this, in our discussion, but just knowing the bare facts would, would just give you some insights. And as I said, I, suggest, I suggested that Mark's gospel is the shortest one, the earliest one too. Have a read of that and just see what you think. Brilliant. Well, Claire and Max, thanks so much for your time. Interesting uh, as ever. Uh, if you've really enjoyed this podcast, uh, remember we've got other episodes, so make sure you don't miss out uh, on those. And um, see you next time. We hope you've enjoyed the podcast. Uh, if you have, remember it's part of a, a series, the Discover Jesus podcast that we're developing to go through the questions that students uh, have about Jesus. Um, visit, if, you, if you've enjoyed it, visit our website, www.agape.org.uk slash discover podcast, where you can find the other episodes as well as information about the speakers uh, that we've had, their, their bios, the resources they've recommended, um, as well as some other resource that we recommend that we reckon you'll really enjoy um, and also there's information there about conversation groups that you can join either online or they're happening all across the country so you can find out if there's one happening close to you all there on the website um, but bye for now